Hello there, this is How to Murder Time, a podcast about books and things. Hello everybody. Watch out. Hello. Hey, it's another book one. It's, it's, it's that time of time again. We are talking this time about Hyperion, the 1990 Hugo novel winner by Dan Simmons. Uh, and I'm just reading through the notes, the, the, the collaborative share, prep show notes for this show, and I think, I think I'm going to have a hard, hard job this week. <laughs> See, I, I, I misunderstood thing, it. I thought it was Hyperion. It was about a new <sighs> form of blacksmithing. <laughs> Uh, oh, that would be fantastic. <laughs> oh, God. Uh, yes, yeah, so um, the basic premise, then, I'll just uh, quickly... Uh, should I do the back of the book? No, because they're, they're, they're always useless. Oh, they're, they're the best. All right, yeah, I'll do the back bit. of the book, then. How uh, did they sell this book? <laughs> <laughs> the universe of the human hegemony is under threat. Invasion by the warlike ousters looms, and the mysterious schemes of the secessionist AI Technocore bring chaos ever closer. On the eve of disaster, seven pilgrims set out on a quest for the legendary time tombs on Hyperion, home to the Shrike, part god and part killing machine, with powers that transcend the limits of time and space. The pilgrims have resolved to discover nothing less than the secrets of the universe itself. That would be oh, a fantastic that, book. That does sound quite, that sounds good, doesn't it? I'll, I'll, That's I'll not track this that one book. Um, well, it's also, some of those book. things don't happen until quite late on into the book. <laughs> There's a lot else that goes on in this book that's not quite as exciting as that makes it sound, certainly. Um, this was my pick. This is my choice. And I'm, I'm already feeling I'm somewhat Why on the back foot and a little persecuted. Yeah. Um, so, I, so basically, this is... is, is uh, the more I thought about it, see, I never really saw this until we were doing the show notes and we were chatting about it and things beforehand. And, and it turns out that this is what this actually is is a short story anthology. Um, what you have is this large framing story, which is the story essentially modelled somewhat on the Canterbury Tales of Chaucer there, which is essentially seven pilgrims heading to across this uh, on the eve of war stro stroke evacuee stroke sort of mysterious border colony world of the uh, human empire there, the hegemony of man there on a pilgrimage to try and visit this this terrifying sort of mythological omnipowerful creature called the shrike who universally murders people but every so often it will grant one of these pilgrims that visit a wish or something and i don't actually remember seeing any precedent for that in the, in the book there was no examples given of that happening to anyone previously so i'm not quite sure why they actually thought this might even happen um but they set off on this uh what what amounts as to uh, quite quite an interesting little travel log across a sort of few futuristic border colony world and the various different uh, set pieces and interesting environments and things they see on the way and of course in on on the way there they're all they're all quite clearly aware that they're well, they're all, most of them are going to die but one of them might survive and get get a wish or get get what they want at the end of it all and so to inc improve their odds this is the reason they're given ostensibly they decide that they ought to share their stories of how they ended up on this pilgrimage and, and what they're seeking and, and in the hope that they can between them puzzle out some clues on how to deal with the shrike when they get to the far end of it all so what happens then is during this uh, framing story, which itself is quite an interesting sort of travel log thing, they take time to tell each other their own personal stories. And each of these takes the form of a, a sort of self-contained short story that goes on throughout the main narrative. There are seven pilgrims, but because of reasons, one of the pilgrims ends up mysteriously killed halfway through and doesn't actually get to tell his Maybe story. Maybe mysteriously killed. Well, actually, the, so there's a lot. There's a lot of cliffhangers get set up in this book, and there is a sequel to it in which a great many of these cliffhangers are painstakingly and, and methodically explained in quite an underwhelming manner. But um, so I'm not going to say anything about spoilers about the the following book in case anyone does still want to work their way through both of these and uh, discover it all for themselves. But, but after anyway, this so, episode, probably not. <laughs> So, so what you actually have is six rather than seven, but six short stories, each of which follows the main no, character. Oh, no, no, no. Six no? stories. <laughs> They're not short stories. Six, six they could stories do of a length. shorter. Mm. <laughs> Can I at this point introduce yes. a quote by allegedly by Harlan Ellison, Go who on, then. in a short story writing workshop that uh, <laughs> this guy went to said, who is this Simmons, bellowed Ellison? Stand up and wave your hand. Show yourself, goddammit. What egomanical monster, uh, monstrosity, has the fucking goal, the unmitigated <laughs> hubris, to inflict a story of a thousand fucking words on the workshop? Show yourself, Simmons. So That sums up this book. So Yeah, well, I just picked up my copy there and had a riffle through. It's about 500 pages in total, and most of it is the, the sort of in internal stories that each of them are telling. So, um, yeah, there's a lot of material in here. And no, no. What? There's a lot of words in here. 
<laughs> and and so yeah, you end up with uh, well, we'll, we'll sort of look at each of the short stories as we go through each of the sort of. I'm going to keep calling them short stories. I don't know why, but novelettes, um, novelettes, yes. Um, but uh, but the overall device is is essentially. I don't know. This is the thing. I I've, I've read this quite a while ago and a few times since, and and I ne- it never really sort of connected and struck me until we were discussing it in the notes here that this is actually a series of short stories this is a collection this is not just one start to end i've sat down with a typewriter and bashed the entire thing out and in that Mm. light suddenly it made a lot more sense yeah it it explains why some of them are rather well written and some of them aren't as well and also it does because probably some of them were written 20 years before the others well Well, the first one was in the 70s i think yeah, or the yeah. last one is actually in the book, but yeah. Yes, yes. So there's a yeah one of them. One of them actually turned up as a sort of standalone story in a previous short story collection he'd done anyway, and that, that, apparently that was the sort of inspiration and seed for developing out the entire mm-hmm. sort of four book world and backstory and everything that went with it. Um, yeah. So so how do we get on with the sort of overall framing story then? Let's have a look at that. The the sort of the journey to the time tombs and the visiting visiting the shrike and such. I really liked the framing story. Mm. It was a decent length had interesting things they went and saw and did. Mm-hmm. It's and, sort of strangers on a train thing, isn't it? These people yeah. don't really know each other before they all turn up at the start and they all, they're all sort of escorted there in grand style on this sort of tree that's a spaceship and then they, they arrive yeah. at this this, um, this sort of c- c- provincial capital city on this outback world that's in a real state of in- imminent invasion and panic and there's a sense of tension on the streets there and, and at the same time they're all getting to know each other and then sort of yeah, taking I'm, various yeah. methods of travel across. There's a barge at one point and this big wind sail thing going across a sea of grass cable cars and all sorts of things going on the thing he's best at is world building mm. the, the the overall thing is part of that and he's brilliant at that he comes up with well I, there are issues as well but he comes up with a great idea for creating a a sort of large interstellar sort of world mm. set of worlds he starts off a, a, a bit uh, unnecessary with his you know writing a uh, playing a piano while watching sons die <laughs> quite, which quite is a pretentious oh, opening, very yeah. very pretentious <laughs> but then he starts to describe the people that are going to meet up for this and mm-hmm. that's when it engaged me because the people he was describing were interesting very sparsely written at that stage just basically did a paragraph sketches, on each, yeah. and the sketches were really good and the characters were interesting mm-hmm. and then when they had you know 500 pages to, for each of them, they became less interesting on occasion. But the the initial thing of those characters, those people, all different, all you know, was brilliantly done. Mm. So it started off really quite strongly. After, if you'd ignored the prologue, which is uh, the consul being dragged into this, yeah, he sort of gets it, called in by the the chief of the yeah. hegemony to go on this mission. I have so issues on. with that, but yeah. Mm. That's a big spoiler, which we'll leave to the end. Okay. Oh, okay. So there's a lot to a lot to like about it. He, he comes up with some great ideas. He doesn't explore them quite enough, so you're left wandering and making it up for yourself, which which can be good, can be bad. I, I, yeah, I really like that kind of thing. I, I don't know if it's just mm-hmm. something about me, but I sort of, the the amount of half explained things in this book and all the way through, including the, the various personal stories that go through, it is a masterclass in in providing enough information for the imagination to just go off and, and invent your own thing. And that yeah. can be good and it can be bad. It depends what you're looking for in well, this kind. Of thing i suppose for, for me it needed doctor who and then a slightly <laughs> more than averagely ignorant companion to appear during the the meet up at the table yes so he can then go behind the scenes and go well what they mean when they say flippity flaffity flume 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 mm-hmm. is and then give us you know just a sentence explaining what they're talking about because he throws labels around but doesn't and nothing else, it's just a really, labels. A really convincing impression of seven people who are utterly at home within their world, mm-hmm. in, and and they don't do the as you know exposition, exposition, yeah, exposition. Much, mad, but you. that would have actually been quite helpful, especially at <laughs> no, the, no, the I, cold there, open. One there. of the stories uh, does do that. Oh, uh, in which uh, one? which one was it? Oh, I can't. What does seeing. do the uh, okay. as you should know? Yeah, uh, I see. I mean, yeah, I'm just looking at John's notes here. You, you, your the very first note you wrote was FF 
FFS stop making up bollocks space names for everything. Yes, that, that <laughs> grated somewhat. And, and, yeah, and, it's a, and, 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 difficult and my line. first, difficult and line. my first paragraph or first sentence was mm. starts with impenetrable techno babble, <laughs> which seems an odd option to try and grab either. So, so, so uh, it was a more polite first version. Yeah, yeah. I mean, to be honest, I, I agree with that. I, I, I hit that as well when at first time I picked it up. But I, I, I sort of just rolled with it because I love techno, techno babble and bollocks space names. It's it's part of the experience for me. But I can see that they it's not a they universal thing. Clever ones. They they just seem so lazy. Yeah, there's a lot of sort of words slammed together, you know, like force space and you know t- farcaster and stuff like no, that. Some of farcaster sort of works. They explained and, it enough, I think. In the end. Yeah. yeah. So farcasters yeah, but, are essentially a Stargate network that are the underpinnings mm-hmm. of this entire space empire. Oh, sort of I say the best together. idea mm. in the entire book. Yeah. Bar, bar none, the best idea it has is yes. ha- using the Farcaster network as doors and windows in houses. Oh, so, so you have Salinas, houses which exist on multiple it's planets. Fantastic, yeah. And also, there's there's a river and a road. They have a they have a main boulevard that runs along the main capital city and then goes through a Farcaster. Because these aren't like Stargates with the wibbly water and everything. They're just literally windows, and you can just see straight through to the other side and what's going on the other side. And they're open constantly. And there's this long road that just travels across twenty or thirty planets in a big loop and comes back to the start again and there's like traffic just going up and down this high street very clever ideas that, that idea alone mm, vindicates the book that well there's there's, <laughs> there's that's exactly there there's, there's so much so many of these fantastic ideas that are really clever and really interesting and i think part of what with what i'm seeing then why i was so sort of you know stunned and impressed by was was the effect of seven short stories slammed together and each short story's got loads of different you know inspirations and ideas and excitements going on inside them and then just to see them all back to back and read them in one go like that to just leave you quite dizzy at the end i think well certainly for me i mean i found it quite sort of fascinating just the sheer number of cool concepts and great ideas that were spinning off constantly throughout this thing but yes it does have a, yeah, a lot of downsides to go with it, a lot of padding a lot yeah. of but early hmm. on one of the things that bothered me is they kept on saying oh well you know it's really important we should do this we should do it. Yes, it was and never then quite they made. never said what it was. I'm not um, entirely sure you even get to find out what each of the seven people act ultimately wants yeah. as their big wish. I mean, some of them do come out right out and say, you know, I'm here to kill the Shrike or, or whatever, you know. But not everyone is <laughs> has, has quite uh, to so be explicit fair, one, in what one they're them, doing this for. One of them absolutely completed his task, which is I'm here to irritate the other six. <laughs> he was brilliant at it. Um, mm. So good, he irritated me as well. <laughs> so let's have a look at the the individual stories then. So each each story is essentially attached to a particular character there. Then, so I think we we for the first one we get to see they sort of draw lots and draw numbers to see who goes first and in what order. And we first first person we meet is Father Lenar Hoyt. Um, he's a he's a sort of uh, a Catholic priest who's on a pilgrimage. To, uh, I can't remember why he's on this pilgrimage, but his story basically is it's a story within a story. It sort of opens immediately with the journal of another priest who he'd gone to like find or that felt a bit cheap the fact that Mm. Everyone's telling their story, but no, he's immediately telling. He tells somebody, else's, somebody story. else's story. Well, it is yeah. relevant and then as, as it goes it. on. <laughs> yeah. So, he, so basically, another priest called Father Paul Dure had been exiled for, I think, faking some archaeological evidence that was supporting Catholic sainthood or that kind of kind of thing. Uh, and so he'd, he'd basically been given a missionary post on on the backwater world of Hyperion, some some seventy hundred years before the events of the framing story. He gets. He goes off into the, the into the wilds through the, the the Tesla forest, which I thought was fantastic. A forest made entirely <laughs> of lightning trees, uh, but you can get I'm through it somehow. I'm not sure how that works. In reality. <laughs> well, that becomes relevant at the end of his story. But he he goes. He, he manages to find a guide and use exotic techniques to get through these lightning trees alive, and finds this rift valley where some of the very first colonists on Hyperion uh, have made a sort of tribe, and they've basically gone back to a kind of barbarism. Uh, and he sort of he's he's sort of writing a journal about their the sort of the eth- ethnographics of it all and he's sort of studying them and he just about manages to gain their trust and sort of studies them a bit and then eventually they turn on him when when he stumbles across them carrying out what appear to be catholic mass ceremonies in in a sort of in a shrine and so on and i think the one of the tribe has a fall and breaks his head open and almost dies but then comes back to life and essentially it's a tale of a kind of technological resurrection miracle that that paul jure sees and then discovers that the 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 
the sort of background behind it all is this weird alien parasite thing that they found in these caves nearby. And if you embed one in your flesh, it grows into the body and then keeps you alive, prevents you from dying. And it's a kind of weird That's zombie a, thing yeah, going on. Won't let you die. Is, won't let is you more, die, yeah, yeah exactly. More, cause, more cause, than keeps you alive. <laughs> yeah, obviously enough, you know, inevitably enough, Paul, you know, Father Jure gets captured by these people and, and planted with one of these and then spends you know the, the rest of his little story, his little journal story trying to uh, reject it, trying to cut it out and stuff and then ultimately ends up trying to kill himself and he can't and but of course every time the thing brings you back to life it makes you more and more of a vegetable um and so it becomes a sort of living hell and all these tribes are all morons and idiots because of it uh, and it eventually ends up with jure managing to crucify himself on one of these lightning trees which just keeps killing him over and over and it's, it's such a grim tale quite, quite it is brutal. it's bleak and then, so Hoyt picks up his own tale where he's gone off to find Jure and he basically finds the skeleton and finds the journal and basically picks it up and then gets some of the local authorities to come and nuke the valley and stuff just to get rid of these abominations. And then just after he's told this tale, the consul, whose like point of view it is, the, the framing story has been told on, takes him aside in private and, and, and we get, we, we're we shown that actually Hoyt has got not only Jure's cruciform, the parasite thing on his body, but another one of his own as well. So he's carrying two of these things and it's keeping him to completely in pain all the time because these 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 parasite things won't let them leave the valley so they they inflict huge amounts of pain anyway so it's quite a grim ending that doesn't really go anywhere particular and presumably hoyt is on his way to uh, try and get the shrike to either take the thing out or try and get back to the valley or something like that not quite entirely made clear well, or i forgot <laughs> the thing i loved about that story is and it's a th if it hadn't opened with that one mm. i would have had massive difficulties getting through the book but it opened with the idea of religion on earth came from elsewhere mm. and not explaining at all where that was or why and that really did intrigue me also you get this really quite evocative and poignant examination of the far future of, of contemporary religions in, in, in science fiction future land. The Catholic Church is pretty much in almost terminal decline in the 27th century because the majority of the population have all gone for this faddy self-help religion called Zen Gnosticism or something. Uh, and it's, you know, this this stalwart core of priests trying to keep the flame alive and trying to sort of find yeah, cause, cause a way of reviving it all. Islam and Judaism are both still working you know become mm. they're still quite powerful well sort of working but certainly more powerful than than christianity is <clears throat> so but then also, mm. it, yeah it just seems strange that uh that of the that there there's a lot of similarities with those religions but yeah only one of them's sort of stumbled and fallen so i i did like the idea that uh, uh god has broken his covenant so maybe judaism is not quite about god anymore mm. which was an interesting concept and of course the sort of rather i don't know slightly hammer hammer fisted uh, examination of the resurrection myth there and then the uh, sort of significantly advanced aliens aspects of pot pot potentially religion is this and that sort of thing interesting though interesting so, and, and surprisingly so, uh, nuanced and deep for so an is the book suggesting that christ actually had an alien parasite <laughs> i don't in, think it's infecting I think, him i don't I think, think it's it mentioned anywhere that these that. alien these parasites existed anywhere except on the hyperion planet there so i don't know uh, I, I got the impression that it was suggesting that, that there was, uh, possibly he was a visitor from another planet. Possibly. Because, uh, yeah, these mazes are apparently found on seven or eight different worlds, and Hyperion's one of them, the mazes, these sort of underground caverns that these parasite things were in. Um, and Earth could have been one of the planets with them, because in the book, Earth has been destroyed. Mm, yeah, that, that sort of gets addressed in, in one of the other stories, but it's an interesting thing. Um, I, I definitely got sort of Heart of Darkness there, a sort of Apocalypse Now feel to the sort of travelling into the into the hinterlands and the sort of cults of it all. It's, it's quite an interesting sort of opener, I think. Yeah, it grabs you, and it's but it is, but it is quite miserable, grim. yeah, and bleak, yeah, and just no one, such a down. No one's having a good time story. at that point. No, though. no, I do. The only one who survives is a drug addict who's being tortured non-stop mm. um, and that's the good that's the good ending that the bad ending <laughs> is being tortured into insanity so mm. yeah great lovely so which, yeah, one does, which one's nick i've got i think i've got them in the um, wrong order there because i've just written a load of characters down but, yeah uh, i think it was cassard 
next. Mm. So, so yeah. we meet oh, Colonel I've, I've, Fedman I've, Kassad, who is a, a Martian-born human. He's all described as being quite sort of slender and tall and willowy because of the low gravity and so on. He's a career soldier who's, who's sort of come up from a sort of ghetto street gang uh, upbringing and sort of falls in with the military, the, uh, the force, force space or whatever they're called in this, this uh, milieu. <clears throat> it's a sort of universal space navy type submarines type of thing and we, we he goes through all the basic training and their basic training at the olympus mons command school on mars is, in, is almost entirely virtual reality based they, they 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 basically immerse themselves in battles of throughout history and we get quite an interesting little little sort of uh, montage of him going through various different historical conflicts you know like the first world war or Agincourt or so on just to yeah. learn the various rudimentary tactics and build up from there presumably but yeah, during, that beginning was rather good. The actual yeah. sort of him in a, a sort of sort of finding himself in different historical wars and going for it and trying to learn what he can from each of those scenarios. Yeah. Sort of an interesting way of doing the, it. Living the life of a downbeat, uh, sort of ignorant soldier slaughtering the French or whatever. Yeah, with longbows and whatever. Yeah. And so during these VR simulations, un and, and, and completely undetected by the people in charge of the VR and his instructors and so on, he starts he starts seeing this recurring woman who keeps turning up. And she doesn't say anything. She just sort of basically jumps him and there's all sorts of all sorts of cyber sex going on there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, I know this supposedly based on uh, Chaucer's sort of tales, and they were Full of sex, mm. but he he told a better sex story than <laughs> uh, Dan Simmons does. It, it, the whole every time Dan started to talk about his masturbatory fantasies, a, I kept yes. on thinking that this was written by a fourteen-year-old. He and, wasn't. And, no. and, and, and I know he's older when he published What's it. The phrase I think Ikea he wrote erotica. It. Mm. <laughs> yeah. He wrote it a long time ago, and you know, he just needed to. To get somebody to, with an editor to say, just let's let's get rid of all of this or write it. <laughs> See, I tend, to, I don't know, it's probably something very wrong with me, but I tend to regard this kind of sex scenes like the poetry stanzas in Tolkien. I, I, I start, I see, I see one coming up, and my eyes just sort of slide straight across and back to the <laughs> back to the narrative again. So, I don't know. That probably says more about me than the book, but well, um, yeah. So, to be he, honest, that's probably one of the reasons why you enjoyed the book more than we did. <laughs> To say it seems like you managed case, to yeah. slide I didn't notice any bad sex writing. What are you guys talking <laughs> about? Yeah. Um, yeah, so he he completes his training, does well, is is a rising star, gets his commands and so on. Uh, but all throughout, he's he's encountering this VR woman repeatedly, and it's becoming apparent that she's not part of the simulation. She's come from outside. She's some other thing, and she's I think there's some sort of agenda going on there. So he sort of works his way up through the ranks, and uh, one of the interesting things with this story, particularly, is is the sort of examination of future warfare, I suppose, or at least what Simmons believes it's going to be. And they have this concept called the new Bushido, which I suppose it's apparently is modelled on ancient samurai and shoguns and things, and is essentially centred around the idea that in a, in a in a colossally high energy particle physics future, most most forms of all out war are going to be utterly apocalyptic for both sides instantly. So they try and rein in war as a concept down to a kind of noble art a kind of limited engagement hand-to-hand -hand combat kind of nobility which is referred to as this new bushido which of course our hero Kassad there then goes and totally violates in a uh, in a in a defensive react, uh, engagement against the ousters, who we learn a bit more about there. Now the ousters is this sort of barbarian deep space uh, rebel contingent of humans who've just gone off into the deep black, and I suppose we're sort of thinking reavers from Firefly, that kind of thing. They're, they're presented That's as this they're terrifying yeah. menace. Yeah, they are they are human, but theoretically post-human because they've gone total zero g you know modifications and all the rest of it and they they have a habit of just raiding border worlds and then disappearing back into the the deep beyond and they they turn up in massive force at this world called brescia where cassad's in charge and he basically makes his name there by just throwing the rule book about honorable combat away and going utterly utterly uh all out on them and and does well but it picks up this name that is the butcher of brescia as a result um, and so he gets he gets critically injured during that fight and then put on a hospital ship on the way back. That hospital ship gets attacked, crashes on Hyperion, the ousters follow him down. At that point he meets the Shrike and his dream woman, but for real, who's wearing some kind of silver liquid metal body armour thing. And, and, and they have they sex again. They have sex again. Um, and again. And, <laughs> and then they, they basically, him and this woman and the Shrike, 
basically just kick the arse of about two or three hundred incoming Elster marines by using all sorts of warpy time manip- manipulating powers and so on. And of course, Casso can't believe his luck, and yes, they have sex again, but then that goes all a bit horrid as well. Um, at and least he doesn't have sex with the Shrike. I mean, I think that would have been a step too far. That's well, a sequel. <laughs> well, well, no, she turns into the Shrike during the act. That's, oh. that, that's the horrific part about it. And he freaks out, and, and he, he sort of puts two and two together and realises that the Shrike and this woman are basically trying to provoke a massive sort of civilizational war against the Alsters for their own amusement or something. He manages to escape somehow, get back to civilization, and that's the end of his tale, really. And he's, his mission is to get to the Shrike and kill him this time. So, yeah, an interesting story, but, yeah, it's a bit too heavy on the uh, the Ikea erotica, I think. What do yeah, you guys reckon? One of the weaker stories, I have yeah. to say. I don't have as many good things to say about that one as I do about the first so, one. Some of the zero-G spaceship combat was quite interesting. Oh, but, uh... Yeah, but I, I struggled with this one more than the first one. Mm. I mean, the first one was bleaker, mm. but the second one was a this bit too self-indulgent. Yeah. Yeah, it's all sort of big action explosions and, and I mean, sort of, you know, gunfights in space and, and which, yeah, lots which, of... Uh... Which, without the sex, would have been really quite enjoyable, <laughs> but the sex just rather overwhelmed everything else in this story. Mm, yeah. What do you reckon, John? I, I thought that it was disappointing. It didn't really... It had a, a thing mm. to say, and then basically just describe sex instead of it could saying have been it. much more there you've got the sort of history of warfare in this future society and the means and mechanisms and the reasons behind it and also the ousters get a bit of an examination here as well which yeah, yeah but the ousters never quite get the examination mm-hmm. they need so when you get to the point later on which will come to they're not quite they where the they sort need of to be big bogeyman that's the civilizational threat from without certainly at the opening of the story and, and yeah we know almost nothing about them which in a way works to create a sort of sense of suspense but it was an opportunity to see yeah. a bit more about them the biggest problem with this story just remembering it now is that it's not told within the framing of this whole idea oh, it's yeah. supposed to be him yeah. telling the others and it's just him the, the story being told from a wrong it's point of view. A, it's just a sort of third person anybody. narrative. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's written in the wrong tense, in the wrong form, and it completely drags you out of the over, overarching story. It, it's almost as if it had been copy and pasted. <laughs> it's it's it feels very, very much like the, the, he, he had his hand in his homework and he just copy pasted <laughs> something in there. And it, it, it felt clumsy, lazy, and it just... Quite, a waste of a waste of effort. Quite jarring in context as well. Remember, this is a yeah. man who's sat around a table with six strangers he's just met to go on a backpacking holiday with, and he's describing some kind of quite graphic and somewhat embarrassing virtual reality mind yeah. sex over it's, and it's, over. We've all <laughs> done that. I've it obviously is that the biggest, Yeah, it mm. is the biggest crime in the whole book. If he's going to only change one thing, mm. he ought to rewrite this story so that it appears to be part of the book, yeah, as yeah. opposed to just the short story that doesn't think fit in any way whatsoever. As much as anything else sort of, sort of reinforces the idea that actually what we've got here is seven completely yeah. different stories that have been sort of quite quite jarringly wrangled into one kind of sort of continuous narrative here. So I'm sorry, Dan. And firstly, you were brave to, to try and uh, have everyone compare you to Chaucer, who was a great writer. Hmm. And, and I'm not sure you're quite in his category. But then just... Copying and pasting this in just makes you look like a dolt. <laughs> it should be said, mm. in his defence, Chaucer well, never won. Well, that's so true. There's the final yeah, analysis. Yeah. Yeah. So the next story, then we go. <laughs> we meet. We meet a chap called Martin Salinas, um, who is mm. an extremely old uh, writer. The, a combination of sort of cryo sleep, travelling below, below light speed between stars, and also expensive medical treatments means he's uh, something like three hundred years old compared to everyone else. He's yeah. Hmm. That's an interesting thing. The the use of uh, what do they call it? Uh, time yeah, debt. If you're time travelling, yes. um, yeah. If you're travelling uh, faster than light, you age differently, and proper, that is proper relative critical to effects, several of the stories. Yeah, and that does come in. Yeah, it makes a point elsewhere. You got two means. You can go travel between stars using Hawking drive ships, which are essentially near light speed ships. Then yeah, you go. In, you're basically put in cryo, and you come out like several several years later. Or you can use the Farcasters if they've been built, because obviously you have to go to the far end and build one in the first place. But yes, anyway. So this chap is he's he's, he's sort of an Andy Warhol type figure. He's 
he's this sort of really bitter and, and quite he's an arse. He's an absolute arse, very obnoxious character. He's constantly baiting the other members, the other pilgrims on this trip throughout the sort of framing story. And when it comes to his turn, he basically tells the big life story of his own work. He's a sort of quite a famous author in world. Hmm. Um, he's yeah. written something called the Hyperion Cantos, uh, the the Dying Earth, uh, the popularly known as. Um, so basically, he was an aristocrat on Earth just before the, what they call the Big Mistake, which is essentially a, a kind of science experiment to create black holes that went wrong and uh, sort of slowly destroyed the Earth, and everyone had to evacuate it and go off into the rest of the stars, which is why there's no Earth and we're all everywhere else instead. But he was one of those or last last aristocratic families to leave the Earth. Something went wrong during his trip. He got brain damage, ended up on a sort of quite grim industrial colony world where he just ends up slopping out vents and things for a living. Yeah, because something else went wrong in his trip from Earth. He forgot to invest wisely <laughs> when he got to the other end. He had no money. Yes, yes. His compound interest was seized or something. So basically he was penniless <laughs> and, and somewhat brain damaged and only capable of doing manual labour. So he, settled, he, he settles into a life of drudgery on this colony world. And during that, he starts, he sort of starts to recover, starts to get his language back. He can't speak properly by the, when he's there to begin with. And as a, as a, as a sort of function of that, he begins writing a novel. And the novel turns out to be this really poignant and quite heartfelt and very nostalgic yearning for the, the earth that now no longer exists. And it, it gets spotted and picked up by publishers, you know, he makes a full recovery. And, it, and it's this sort of, it's quite a, I don't know, self I don't think he ever makes a full recovery. I think he's brain damaged throughout the entire book. Perhaps. I, it's the only way it explains quite <laughs> what an arse he is. But he becomes a sort of colossal success amongst the uh, the glitterati of the hegemony mm. because of the work. It, it hits the, exactly that right spot of nostalgia and everyone goes mad for it. And of course he's badgered into writing sequels just for the money. So he turns, he starts, he writes more and more sequels that are just worse and worse and much more than by the numbers and so on. And he gets into big arguments with his publisher. We get an excellent examination of the high life of day-to-day -day hegemony life and also a bit of the history of how the hegemony came about in this story, which I really enjoyed. Um, and then eventually he sort of goes off, flounces off in a huff and decides to exile himself to Hyperion to join an artist's colony that's just been set up there. And this whole, you know, sort of really sort of pretentious artist commune full of sculptors and, and you know, painters and posers and stuff. And he's he, he starts to find his mojo again. He starts to continue writing the Hyperion Cantos the way he wanted it. But of course, while this is all going on, all the other artists on this colony are being picked off one at a time by the Shrike, who lives quite nearby. Um, and so eventually he's he's just at the point where he's just about got his breakthrough with his, his, his magnum opus, his life's work. And then the Shrike sort of abducts him and, and freaks out and then he manages to escape. And he finds, and later he's back on this pilgrimage. And presumably his, his, his purpose to be on the journey is to get the final bit of his story written because he, he loses his sort of inspiration straight away again after he's left so it's in some fashion the the shrike is sort of powering his his creativity mm. what do we think of this one i'd have been i hated it i don't like martin <laughs> silenus as a he's character he's not a nice character at all and, but i think so, he's supposed to be no yeah. i think that's true but also if you're going to have a character who is claimed to be this great artist and great poet mm. stop having him repeat doggerel from 500 years previously and say oh well he's a great artist because he knows some old poems it's yeah. either either create the poetry that he's supposed to be great for and everyone responds like it's wonderful and we don't understand because we're not from that era but because his actual it shows... Hyperion Cantos turns out to be sort of yeah. quite derivative based on Keats Hyperion, yeah. which in turn is a, a sort of reworking of an ancient, the ancient Greek tale of how the Olympian gods th overthrew the Titans before that came before them. So, yeah, the it's, there's thing, a lot of internal reference sort of, after internal yeah. reference after internal reference. And I sort of found myself a little bit bored by that. Yeah, yeah. yeah the whole thing sort of shows either a lack of commitment to the character mm. because you're not writing his poetry you're just everyone's saying he's great without any evidence of informed ability yeah yeah or you've got no confidence in your own ability to write decent i suppose that's words. The, that's the thing isn't it if you so either the author yeah. of this book is is uh not very uh sort of certain <laughs> himself or He's just, he should have created another character. Cre create somebody else, not a great poet. Because if you can't create a great poet, don't try. Mm. That was my opinion. Yeah, of it. Yeah. it just he the character was irritating, but that wasn't the only I, I reason think, that I he, on the he got, he got if, if the character had been someone who wrote overly long short stories, <laughs> he well, would have it down this, this whole The whole midsection of that story, which is essentially him 
bickering with his with his agent, his literary agent, and the sort of foibles of the publishing industry and how how people uh, are stupid and keep buying up paperback junk and all this. It all sounded a bit. I, I was I, I was, was just sort of, with him you know, going point. a bit glassy eyed at that point and wondering is this sort of degenerated into some personal vendetta or something? I don't know. I've no idea how successful Simmons is in other work or whether he's gone oh, through anything maybe, like this. But it showed a lot of Simmons ins and outs about about the publishing industry that yeah. seemed more than casual. <laughs> Maybe know. Simmons didn't copy paste this into a novel. Maybe these are just letters he wrote to his publisher <laughs> and his publisher then copy pasted them into a novel. I don't know. I mean, I, I'm wondering if this is there been, some yeah. sort of barbed dig at, at, at being for, you know, creatives being forced to dance for money or something like that. I don't know no, what they don't was have going to on be. there. They can, write, they can self-publish and just write, write stories for themselves mm. and not need money. But, but if they want to be paid, they really ought to write something people but this this turned on. out to be my favourite of the short stories in the end, but largely because of the the real detail we get to see the hegemony itself, and you know the the intricate society that goes on around it, and the the Talcetti Centre and the big office block, and the all thing and the chat shows and so on, and and yeah, the the, the 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 what happened to Earth, you know, the starting of it all there, that was quite fascinating to me as well. But yeah, despite the character being perhaps the most unlikable in the entire thing, it's odd, odd. Yeah, I'm, I think we've all got favourites from this selection mm, of stories, mm. but uh, that this certainly wasn't mine. No, no. Um, but but I, you know, it's I can certainly understand why it was yours because the world building is the thing that this. It's guy when does we get best. to see Dan, the Dan Simmons, of it all. This is where we his, see the house. Is the house when he's super rich and super famous, he pays for this ridiculously expensive house, which is essentially a normal house, but every door frame is a Farcaster gate. So basically, every room is on a different planet. Some of them tens and hundreds of light years apart, and he's just casually wandering between planets as he's going around his house. Now, that's exactly the kind of sort of inventive genius that I really sort of prize mm -hmm. in this novel. But, but then again, yeah, the the character's a bit bit nasty, and and some of some of his sort of intern, I don't know, some of the minutiae that we see in the publishing, you know, the, the, how, how bad the publishing industry is, gets a bit, <laughs> I don't know, went over my head a bit, I don't know. Okay, so then we move on to meet Saul Wintraub, who is a kind of, uh, I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right, Weintraub? Weintraub. Weintraub, okay. Um, he's, a, he's a Jewish ethics professor and scholar who, who's, who's got a, a comfortable life in a university and a slightly off, out of, you know, slightly backwater world. Uh, and his daughter is an archaeologist who's just gone off to, to uh, investigate and do some digging around in the time tombs, which uh, is the, the actual destination of the framing story. It's where they're all trying to get to in the, uh, the framing story. This is all happened sort of about 20 years up prior um and and the time tombs are a weird weird sort of set of ruins and architectural follies that uh, appear to be going backwards in time and have all sorts of weird time effects around them so obviously they're they're interesting and people want to understand them yeah, yeah but never quite as much interest as you think that maybe <laughs> people like two or three people possibly have about there with measurements yeah. These things yes. completely oh, break physics. Yeah. Nah, yeah. So the Shrike care. is somehow linked to these things, but I don't think the Shrike had been making appearances at that point, so they obviously thought it was safe to go and, you know, set up a dig and poke around inside these things. Anyway, the inevitable mishap happens. Um and the daughter, Rachel, she ends up uh, disappearing for like a short spell during one night and then turning up the next morning with no memory of the previous day. Uh, and what happens is it transpires that she, for some weird reason no one can understand, she is now aging backwards. Every 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 24 hours she goes back another 24 hours. So basically she's living backwards a day at a time, including losing her memories of the previous, you know, the, the days of her, of her own future, which is quite a tragic kind of thing. It's referred to as the Merlin sickness by, you know, as a sort of shorthand. <laughs> And she's physically yes, yes, she's aging, literally aging well. backwards a day at a time and forgetting, basically regressing back into childhood. So whenever she sleeps, she yeah. loses a day of life. And they life try, and they memory. try science. They try keeping her awake and stuff. And she eventually, as soon as she does pass out, it, it happens, and there's nothing anyone can do about it. It's absolutely, it absolutely boggles the medical industry, and it makes something of a freak show of her and her, her, her father as well, who's rushed over, and, and mother who've rushed over to try and sort of find out what's going on. And so you know, after being passed around and around all these various medical facilities with no clue what's going on and lots of you know aggressive paparazzi type coverage they eventually decide to uh, disappear off to off grid to uh, a kind of uh, jewish uh, hebron it's called it's like a jewish world that's sort of set up as a big kibitz and uh, you know souls got contacts there and they don't let any visitors come in you know it's, it's quite a private sort of community so they managed to find some sort of respite and 
get away from things there. And in all the time, she, this 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 woman is sort of going backwards in time. There's a, there's a poignant scene where she forgets or doesn't recognise her, her fiance anymore, and she's starting to not. You know, they're having to sort of move her around different schools a lot because you know, it's just freaking people out. Yeah, and she misses her school friends from the day before, yeah. who are now forty years old, and yeah. You know, and and it, it's it's really tragic. It's really poignantly it's, told. It's well written. Yeah, it's yeah. very well written. One of the most I think powerful is, ones for me. For me, this is the best story mm-hmm. in the whole thing. Um, this is oh, really is. powerful, brilliantly written, a great idea, done superb. Sort of the real human um, impact of of time yeah. shenanigans. Yeah, what does that mean really in real terms? For, yeah. And it's told from two points of view because it's told from the point of view of, of Rachel to begin mm. with, or her you know her reporter yeah. of it and then from soul's point of view afterwards yeah and he's he's getting and older and older and he's got a daughter yeah. who's basically aging backwards in time so by the time he's 50 she'll be like one again and it, you know it's 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 there's, there's the strain on him and his wife his wife sort of dies in a car accident sort of halfway yeah. through and so he's left to have and to deal with it all himself and of course during the while well, this is all going on he's then he's now starting to get weird dreams because throughout his professional career he'd been sort of uh, quite fascinated and wrote all sorts of books and, and white papers and monologues and things on on some of the classical biblical paradoxes and so on, and in particular the, the binding of Isaac, I think it's referred to, when God appears to Abraham and commands that he sacrifices his only son as a, as a show of loyalty. And, you know, he sort of wrestles with yeah. that idea of what kind of God demands that and what does this prove and so on. And, and of course now he's finding that this essentially is starting to happen to him because he's getting dreams of, of, a, of a sort of weird, bladed, glowing-eyed voice, which you know turns out to be the Shrike, commanding him to take his child, his only child to the shrike and, and sacrifice it and 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 we see a lot more of the shrike religion yes as he tries to sort of go there and, uh, and ask about yeah because that. but i always got the impression the shrike religion is people who worship the shrike mm. but have no connection or relation to him at all i don't oh, it's, think it's, there it's was fanboys, any relationship yeah. Yeah, yeah there's, there's no exactly, there's no reciprocality yeah. at all and i don't think any of the sh- because the shrike is so powerful they the, the, the whole cult has formed up around it but i don't think any yeah. it's not a sort of yeah. a sanctioned thing it's yes, basically yeah, it's a an apocalyptic mm-hmm. cult who worship the Shrike as a kind of herald of of the uh, called the Church of the Last Atonement, something like that. And mm-hmm. yeah, they get involved as well. And that they, I think, they pull strings to allow Sol to take his child on this trip. And and actually, during the framing story, Sol is introduced with a, a one month old baby with him that he's feeding with milk packs and so on, and not explained at all until we hear this story. And then suddenly you understand what's going on there, and it, it becomes quite horrific. Yeah. Very yeah. powerful story, very and, and yeah, quite grim, but not in the sort of grim and futile sense that the the priest's story, you know, Lena Hoyt's tale is. This one's much more compassionate, much more feeling, I suppose. Yeah, sort of. Yeah, I haven't got a lot to say about this. It's just a really yeah, good story, yeah, well told. And if that, if I read that as a short story, I'd interesting really stand with yeah. Dan Simmons. Yeah. Okay, so then we got we meet Braun Lamia, who is a woman from Lucia, which is one of the colony worlds where the gravity is much stronger, so everyone's quite heavy, thick set, muscular, and so on. She is a private detective uh, who is the daughter of a murdered senator under mysterious circumstances, and she's approached by a client, and it, it does the scene where she's at her desk, and the minute he walked in the office, I knew he was trouble. I mean, it is, it is such, it's like he's just decided to kick off his shoes and just have a bit of fun with it with a Raymond Chandler homage there which then again it really reinforces it, the, these are it really external short match. stories he's thrown together yeah. he felt he felt yeah, like right it's a sort of gumshoe Chandler detective story. kind of thing but set in a cybernetic After. future reasonably sure i can tell you what book you've read before this <laughs> yeah so this this client this mysterious client turns up who wants help solving his own murder and it turns out that this this chap who's called johnny um is actually a cybrid which is a kind of synthetic android humanoid type replicant type thing created by the techno core now the techno core is basically when all of all of earth's ais and robots rose up and instead of going on the kill crush destroy laser eyes ro- robot rebellion they just disappeared instead they all buggered off some where and no one knows where they are now but they occasionally send representatives to the human race and they decided to instead of destroy the human race they work with the humans and and, and share a great deal of benefits of technology and so on so you've got this sort of mysterious techno core who clearly have their own kind of agenda you, you from the word go you, you you get the sense that the relationship between the techno core and mankind is not a you know a happy happy two-way street there's something weird going on there and this story is is a good one because we get to ex- examine the techno core in a lot 
more detail and find out what their angle is and where that's all coming from. Um, so the, the hybrid is trying to find out who killed his previous version and why. And so we end up with a lot of running around and gun battles and, and, and car chases and so on. Where, and not a lot gets resolved in this one, to be honest. <laughs> um, but we end up... Uh, it, it, then, it then sort of halfway through, it turns into a kind of neuromancer pastiche where we meet this hacker who helps them go into cyberspace and then we get to explore the techno core from within inside, with inside cyberspace and so on. And again, it's all a bit confusing and a lot, not a lot goes on, but we get... We get told that the, the Technocore is actually built up of factions and each of them has a different, you know, there's a big power struggle going on and one of these factions is indeed in favour of the kill, crush or destroy all humans plan but the others are holding them back and there's all sorts of intrigues going on there. And then after a lot more running around and chases and gun battles and stuff, she he, Johnny gets killed again. Uh, she's ended up pregnant because there was some more sex that I must have blacked out for or yeah. skipped over. Um <laughs> This sex was also <laughs> And also bad. she's woken up with an implant in the back of her head that contains a, personality, a dormant personality copy of the Cybrid. And she's taking either the child or the implant to meet the Shrike for reasons. I, I, I lost track a bit there. So, okay, John, which was the worst sex? <laughs> was it was it Cassard sex or Lamia sex? I think Cassard yeah, sex I was agree. worse. <laughs> but this... But um, she uh, gets uh, bonus points for uh, doing one of the fights oh, naked gosh, for yes. no apparent I, reason. I totally blanked that out. I had something wrong with me, I think. But um, yeah, so, so what do we think of that? I mean, there's a lot more of investigation of the sort of grubbier, seedier side of, of the hegemony and so on. But And also the technical itself is, is an interesting concept that bears examination. <laughs> What I got from this was they appear to have hive worlds. Yes, I hadn't yes, mentioned it like until that point. Sixth story in or something. It, it, you, you thought... You thought everything was nice, sort of. No, it's a real lovely industrial little hive, towns yeah. and everything, and yeah, and then there's just this hive world, which <laughs> maybe makes more. But well, again, it's 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 jarring in its discontinuity and inconsistency with everything else that's gone on. It, this this one is definitely one that shows that these are all sort of perhaps hastily rewritten so that they seem to be all telling the same tale. I don't know. Well, yes and no, because I think what this one does is start to show the seedy underbelly of the head Germany mm. much more than the previous ones have. Yeah. All all the others have I and mean, you've had the bit of trouble with the the press in the previous one mm. but, but generally the hegemony are the good guys yeah. as far until you get to this yeah. one and then they start to become the bad guys and then the book after this or the story after this again suggests that we've been seeing one side of the story about them. yeah so I can see why this came when it did it's there so that you are changing your opinion of the the hegemony as the stories go on. Mm. So uh, around about this time, the the seventh member of the party gets murdered or vanished or killed or something. Basically, they just they 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 or, thought or just <coughs> or just runs off and leaves his. They blood find his room whatever, awash with yeah. blood, and he's left behind a weird energy yeah. cube which contains a strange energy being. This is the the Templar Hetmastine, who's who's like some sort of druid type well, maybe character who who is the captain of the ship they all came the- here on. <coughs> They never actually work out what's inside that box. They yeah, just assume yeah, the box is a sort of mystery for its own sake, I think. Um, so then we get to meet the console. So the console, it's the, the framing story is being told more or less from the point of view of the console, who isn't, I think he does get named, but it's so inconsequential and after the point at the very end of it all that it doesn't really matter. So he is the pre, he's a high ranking hegemony diplomat who is a former, who was the former governor of Hyperion before he sort of stepped down to let someone else do the job and retreat, went off into retreat. He's come back and he's been after, uh, He's after a uh, <clears throat> he's after something of his own, and he's been given permission to sort of join the part, join the expedition. So he eventually tells his own story, and again, this is him. He just he, he immediately <laughs> dumps into somebody else's story. He starts telling the tale of his grandfather, who is uh, who is a young cadet engineer type in the Hegemony Navy, Space Navy Engineer Corps type thing, and they were responsible for building a forecaster gate on an unspoilt paradise world called Maui Covenant, which is a sort of Hawaiian sea ocean world with all sorts of indigenous floating island life forms and dolphins live there and it's and the, yeah the remains yeah, of the dolphins from generally the a kind of paradise planet uh, and they're building and obviously they're, they're, they're going to build a massive portal that will allow hundreds of thousands of people to come through whenever they like to trample all over the place and that's generally regarded as a bad thing by a lot of the residents but um but so the, they've been kept, so the, the 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 engineer team who are building the portal gate are, are kept away from the locals but the uh, the the grandfather sneaks away with a friend on a on a flying magic carpet um yes <laughs> <laughs> using electro 
retro technology type thing so they have actual flying carpets um and they they sneak off to a nearby nearby island and meet up with a load of the natives get on famously he meets a woman there's i think some more sex i wasn't paying attention there's, there's some underage sex in she's this quite, one she's yes. quite young yes yeah statutory rape right because uh, you know because there wasn't enough sex in the previous <laughs> stories so let's bring in the statutory but it's okay because they're stage. deeply in love we've you, you've when, when you're telling a story, you just have to keep up the mistakes <laughs> until the point where you realise, oh my mm. God, I've crossed a so, horrible line. Um, yeah, but he falls in love with her and she falls in love with him and the, the, it's all hearts and flowers and romance and so on. But his best mate, who also went out on this jolly, ends up in a big bar fight and I think he gets killed. He gets knifed or something by yeah. some belligerent uh, relatives of the woman. So it all kicks off. Anyway, after after they get discovered and picked up and he gets court-martialed and stuff and told off and things, <clears throat> he basically goes away on the ship back to wherever, back to the centre of hegemony to get more parts for the gate or whatever what have you they're rubbish at building you think they would yeah, parts in yeah, one trip they are rubbish at building things it took them how many it took them about 70 yeah, years yeah. to build because one of gate. some plot um he's he's forced <laughs> to go into a relativistic temporal uh, stasis type thing for for a number of years but he promises to come back and she promises to wait for him so and and she does and so they what then follows is i think seven or eight trips they're called the called reunions and they 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 this this relationship takes on the status of, of local folklore amongst the the, the islanders and so on how he, this 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 chap keeps coming back every sort of 10 10 years or so and hasn't aged at all meanwhile she's getting a quite a bit older it's that old sort of time traveler's wife type sort of concept mm-hmm. examined in some detail which is interesting i mean i've, I've it's not it's not original, i think that was quite well done well yeah the, yeah the, 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 the problem aging, of him get, is, not growing yeah. up yeah, but they they love yeah. the, the strong. thing you first see in someone at the age of twelve isn't what you're looking for when you're seven. Well, that's right. We'll just go on a spaceship trip, and when we get back, she'll be much older, uh, and it'll be fine. <clears throat> Yeah, in the end, they only ever spend yeah, like hundreds yeah, it's, of it's, days together. Yeah, it's a together. weird, staggered whirlwind romance, but that it takes 70 years in total. Anyway, he comes back for the very last trip uh, to find that she's died of old age, which is, you know, fair enough. <clears throat> and so he said, you know, the, the, the whole island's, by this time, it's become a sort of legendary folklore thing, and the whole island's turning out in a kind of, you know, respectful funeral type thing. And he's he's allowed to go up to the tomb on his own to say his last respects and so on. And at this point, he's still only 23 or something, you know, despite her having died of a, 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 at 80 or so. And he goes to the tomb and finds that the the the, cof, the coffin's empty, and instead inside is a hologram thing with precise instructions on how to cause a massive uprising and rebellion. And so he, in the end, decides, yeah, all right, we'll go with that. And they they stage the islanders stage a massive uprising to uh, wreck the, the the incoming portal because already the uh, you know the the impact of visitors and stuff has started to cause all the marine life to die off and become polluted and just wreck the world and stuff. And so part we're left not quite knowing if the relationship was just a cynical thing on her. Her part to destroy the incoming invaders or whether he you know she, she won him over and he had a real change of heart or, or what whether there was a genuine affection and it, there and at it all. turned out yeah and the rebellion turned out to be a complete failure it, it in fails the end, anyway. the end yeah yeah, and and so As they the, do. the force space lot come in in in, in great force and uh, utterly utterly is a massacre. They just trash the place, and then we're t- you know we're shown that uh, you know twenty or thirty years later the place is just a, a horrific tourist hellhole, and all the local fauna have died off anyway, proving that they were right all along, but just unsuccessful. The dolphins all die. Yeah. They kill off the dolphins at last, yeah. which was probably the plan. And these motile the islands, these sort of sentient living islands that, that were native in on this island, on this world, um, and so then we go back to the console who. Then then, you know, we have a bit more story about him and he's nursing, essentially nursing a grudge on behalf of his grandfather for the whole time. And it turns out that he's actually a double agent for the with the ousters. He's sent off to spy on the ousters. And um, and I, I think towards the end, he's like a double or treble agent or something, because he's sent to, to infiltrate the ousters and pretend to be a spy, but then actually goes over to their side because he's been nursing a long, you know, he's basically been spent 20 years waiting for his moment to enact a terrible revenge on the hegemony. Uh, and then he put, he actually sets off a device the ousters were going to use that accelerate the time tombs backwards through time and cause the Shrike to unleash itself on the entire hegemony as a kind of final act of revenge. And uh, for some reason, I, I think he gets away from the end of that and then suddenly here he is on the pilgrimage. And I can't quite remember what his actual purpose was to go on the pilgrimage, but... <laughs> His purpose was to start the book at <laughs> the end of the book. He's there as a commentator, I suppose. Because at the start, he's thinking, oh, who's the, tra- and it was- who's the traitor? 
It's oh, me all along. Yeah. 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 Thinking about himself. it. Yeah. yeah, I can work out whose side he was on in the end. He, ch- he does sort of change sides a lot. And in the end, I think he's just out to destroy everything for his own petty grievances anyway. So. Yes, my grandfather's dead, so I'm going to kill the universe. <laughs> this, will, this will pay yeah, you back for the odd, dolphins. Odd yeah, unleash the shrike on everyone. I've heard <laughs> worse reasons. Yeah. So that's, that, that's, that's pretty it's much all better of than it. the my grandmother died of old age, so I'm going to kill the universe. That's a really <laughs> that that's an even weaker petty, argument. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, and so the end, after all these stories are told, they arrive at the time tombs, and then um, it sort of stops there. They 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 <laughs> they've, all, they've all unburdened themselves. They're all ready to face the unknown. No, he doesn't hmm. so much stop. Yeah, as they, they, run they, out. they actually. <laughs> That it ends with them holding hands and skipping off down into the Valley of the Time Tomb, singing, we're off to see the wizard from the Wizard of Oz. Um, Um, (laughs) I I wrote, before I finished the story, I wrote, well, okay, we've got these little stories Mm. and they're all incomplete because we haven't got to see the Shrek. So you've got six incomplete short stories. The the story goes that they're all going to die apart from one and they'll get to complete their stories. So instead what we get is... Six incomplete short stories, and, an incomplete and then framing the book story. runs yeah. out. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And then the book runs out. And bizarrely, I was really surprised that didn't bother me anywhere near as much as I thought it. No, was me neither. It seemed fitting in a way because this whole yeah. book for me is a masterclass in don't explain the joke. It's it's uh, no, set exactly. stuff up, and, and, and I didn't even mind that there were so many unresolved cliffhangers. You know, I thought, okay, it, no, well, I can just imagine. It's a masterclass in painting yourself into a corner, <laughs> and then. What he does is he realises there's a door behind him, so he sneaks out, closes it, and that's it. <laughs> Look over there, a shrike. I'm off. Yeah. It did not feel mm, like he had no. a plan And that is sort of consistent with the nature of the construction it, of it, which essentially is six very good but somewhat independent short stories all put, well, varying quality short stories all put together into one more or less coherent framing story, I suppose. It works for me, but I can see why people might not agree. <laughs> I, th- I think, yeah. Well, I... I, I wrote, I'm actually very interested to see how mm. these tales get linked together. Spoiler, they <laughs> well, don't. Well, they actually, they do. Now, there is, a, there is a sequel to this book called The Fall of Hyperion, which is of a similar length. Um, and <laughs> You're selling it really well. <laughs> I know none of you are going to read it. Um, but it, what it does is it basically spends about 400 pages painstakingly tying off every single loose end in, 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 a, in quite an underwhelming way. I, I remember coming away from the end of it thinking, huh, you know, so essentially, it's a bit it. like a forum, anal- forum, forum analysis of an MMO, mm. uh, trying to explain it all uh, <laughs> by, and it's never very by worth reading. By the end of the fall of Hyperion, there are no loose ends at all, and, and that's that's quite uh-huh. an achievement considering how many cliffhangers he leaves himself with at the end of Hyperion. But but it, it just seems, uh, I see, like that is it. Uh, I mean, the whole story, you no longer have the Canterbury Tales thing going on. It's actually told from the viewpoint of another cybrid Johnny Keats who turns up out of nowhere and, and for some reason has... Uh, How does that work? Because there was only one... There, no, I don't know. The There's another one died. shows up. I'm not sure it's even proper, pr- properly explained. I'm not sure I can be the bothered cloud. to explain. It's always the Probably cloud. Probably the cloud, yeah. Oh, did he leave another... <laughs> did, did he create another... Um, uh, Cliffhanger. Uh, there, no, the third, no, the, the third and fourth books are unrelated. They're they're a, a, a book and a sequel of their own. They're they're in the same universe, but sort of a couple hundred years later in different characters. But no, the 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 this this cybered fellow has has the weird ability to dream what other people are experiencing in real time, because of networks or something Wi-Fi. So that's that's essentially the the sort of narrative point of view that lets you then see what's going on inside everyone else's heads throughout down in the time tombs and stuff. Oh, it's it's yeah yeah. I mean, in some ways, I'm glad I read it because I now I know how it all ends. But I wish I hadn't read it because it just really does suck all of the magic and, and mystery out of <laughs> uh, of Hyperion, which is something I think Hyperion does well. Perhaps unnecessarily, I don't know. There's a, there's a lot good about Hyperion. The world building mm, is brilliant, yes. and some of the writing is utterly. It's superb. a fantastic universe. It's well but, constructed. Yeah, I think it would have been more to my taste if he'd been given 15 pages for each short story. <laughs> Because yeah, probably he could, could have, have fitted what yeah. happened into that, and it would, in most of them, it would have been an awful lot better. I think he'd have lost some he of the world building if he'd have had to rattle through it. Maybe a little. Yeah, and then maybe we had a sex. Little. And then next morning, yeah. Let's <laughs> <laughs> skip that. Save some pages there, definitely. Mm. So, so what do we think yeah, overall? They were all overwritten. A lot of them were very overwritten, mm. but there's a lot 
there's a lot to recommend about this. The world building's brilliant. Some of the stories are really heart wrenching and very well written. It is very but, sweeping. I, like, I mean, yeah. if you like, if you love the grand scale of things, so, I mean, that's sort of reminiscent of the culture in some ways. Although Banks has a you know, entirely different style about him, but that kind of large scale human endeavour going forward into the centuries is, is dressed really well, and that's something I really look for in these these sorts of you know, space opera stuff. What do you reckon, John? I think that when it comes down to it, it, it's a decent book and probably somewhat telling of its age. I mean, it, it was written in the 80s, which... 89 it was written, yeah, yeah. One, one in 90. Well, it would have been written before then it came well, out. Well, yeah, <laughs> when the short stories were written. This thing. was written over a decade, I'm pretty sure. Yes. Uh, and it, it may not have been the best time for sci-fi. And this, I think falls into a lot of the traps of 80s sci-fi and it does fall into the trap of being overly long and you know tries the, to cover a bit too many yeah, bases it, it's it's too big mm. for the sake of it i think just because mm. printing technology yeah. had made spines a bit wider or whatever <laughs> <laughs> yeah i'm people bought books by the yard they and, I still and this do. is definitely yeah this is <laughs> definitely a book that that was written and there's an awful lot of filler between the covers i did actually ask Ask, what's the tog rate of this book? <laughs> because <laughs> Tobex's tog rating, yeah, it's, it's quite high. It's, it's, def- it's at of, least an autumn an awful tog, lot of filler. I think, yeah, possibly even winter. <laughs> four season. Mm. It's a four it's season, a four season novel. novel. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So thumbs up, thumbs down. Do you, do you guys like it or not? I I'm liked it, I but then it. I picked it. So you know. I think, it, mm, I think if it had been a collection of short stories, I'd do what I do with most collections of short stories, read the one or two I like and ignore the rest. Mm. Uh, and this made me read all of them, and i that's not what I want from a collection of short uh, stories. Fair enough. Yeah, a bit more effort into tying the stories together and cut them down would have improved it. But all in all, I'm glad I read it. It, it does say enough interesting things to justify the month of not being able to read anything else. Mm. <laughs> oh, I do appreciate your patience. Let's have a quick look at the other nominees for this year. Then we had A Fire in the Sun by George Alec Effinger. I have no idea about that. Anyone? Okay, I'm nope. guessing it's all of the rest are at least an inch wide, just because uh, of the era. Yeah, Prentice <laughs> Alvin by Orson Scott Card. Oh, I know him. Mm, I've heard that name. <laughs> Uh, the Boat of a Million Years by Paul Anderson. I know him. Uh, and Grass by Sherry S. Tepper. I don't know anything about any of those. I mean, she's such a uh, one of my wa- wife's favourites. Ah, okay. Grass by Sherry S. Tepper. Mm. So, I mean, looking at that list, I, I suspect Hyperion probably should have won, but I don't really know enough about the others to say for sure. Maybe yeah, it was... Who knows? They're, there's there's nothing sort of yeah. out of this park else in that list, I don't think. Yeah, but... you're not sort of saying, uh, you know, foundation... Uh, by Isaac Asimov, and you think, how did that not win? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay, cool. Uh, we'd probably better wrap up then. So anyone playing along at home, uh, we are going to be reading next uh, the 2009 winner, which is uh, The Graveyard Book by Neil Gaiman. So that would be interesting. And and it okay. is a lot easier to read because it's considerably <laughs> shorter. Apparently much shorter. Yes. So uh, a short month is coming up. Excellent. Never mind so, the width, uh, feel the quality. <laughs> so with that we'll see you next time goodbye bye bye